We have a, uh, an amazing um, speaker this morning, um, and I believe uh, Pastor Butch and uh, they know each other for uh, a while now. Um, I know when I met him this morning, uh, he uh, spoke to me a little bit in Tagalog. I was like, whoa, you know, and, and I believe he was probably a little bit shocked because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a dark guy, a black guy, and speaking in Tagalog too, so. Both uh, him and I we were shocked. But anyway, I don't want to take uh, more of, of, of his time this morning because I want you guys to um, listen to his, uh, um, his, his message this morning. And I, I mean, it's amazing. We heard it this morning at 8 o'clock. But like I say, I just want to bring out Dr. Uh, Dean Dickens. Can you come up here, please? So, I hope the next church that I go to, I can steal your worship team. The whole, the whole group. What a, what a phenomenal group you have. I hope you know how blessed you are. Uh, it is true that uh, Pastor Butch and I have been friends for many years. The first three years we were not friends. I was his preaching professor. And so there you go. Um, Butch had asked me several times, hey, Dean, I can't get him to call me Dean. Uh, Dr. Dean, uh, would you come to my church? I want you to, I want you to dress up in, in your uh, Jewish garb and do this sermon on where you are Moses. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that, Butch. And uh, he said, well, would you come and do Elijah? Would you be Elijah? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that, but that's too much trouble to get dressed up. <laughs> so the other day when he called me, he said, uh, I have to be out of town. Would you come? And it's Valentine's weekend. Would you come and, and preach on love? And I, you know, I thought, well, I've turned him down twice already uh, on, on Moses and Elijah. So I said, yes, I'll come and do something. I'll do something on love. So uh, we read the passage a moment ago from John chapter 21. And if you have your Bible real handy, I hope you'll open it because I want to refer to it several times. But I want to make an observation with you. Uh, love is a common phrase for us as Christians. I mean, we just toss it around uh, in the church. And, and uh, it's sort of like a... Well, when Carl and I lived in Baguio City up in the mountains, and our friends would come visit us, they would, uh, you know, and there was always, oh, oh, I don't want to look at the mountains, it's just beautiful. Well, we got where we didn't see them anymore because we were used to them. We woke up with them in the morning, we went to bed with the beautiful mountains at night. Or we would go down to the beach and someone would say, oh my goodness, what a beautiful sunset. But we experienced so many sunsets, we never saw them again. I have a feeling that that's the way it is when we Christians talk about love. It just sort of is a part of our vocabulary that rolls off our tongues pretty easily without our actually stopping to think about it. In fact, if you will stop and think about it, uh, we say, uh, I mean, we, we, we in English, we have one word for love. I mean, my goodness, how many words? Filipinos. Mahal. Amor. We've got so many different words. But, you know, in English, we just have one word for love. And so we say, oh, man, I love this chocolate cake. Or Ponset or whatever. <laughs> oh, I love my dog. I love my husband. I love Jesus. And we say them all sort of the, the same way. It's, it's, it's kind of an overworked word that we stop thinking about. Now, uh, I Googled the other day Hollywood love and marriages. Huh. I just wanted to see what it was like. And it began to name... Uh, there are probably three people right now on the phones who are Googling Hollywood love and marriages. Well, anyway, what you'll see, 
It's not unusual for people in Hollywood to be married eight times, seven times. Several years ago, I read of one woman who, having her sixth marriage, someone asked her, why do you bother to get married anymore? She said, I still believe in love. <laughs> but this is an overwork word. But the passage that we're going to look at today is a pretty powerful passage that is just filled with some things for us to think about in terms of love. Now, incidentally, if you were to go, if you were tomorrow, if you were to walk into a half-price bookstore or books a minute and say, give me a book on love, they would look at you like you're crazy because the library is filled with books on love. <laughs> There's a, there are the romance novels. There's the psychology stuff. There's the self-help stuff on love. If you could learn to be loving by reading books on love, we would be one of the most loving nations and people in the world. But we're not. Let's talk about love for a minute. Look at John chapter 21. And let me set the passage, let me, let me set the passage in its context for you so that you get an understanding of where it is and what's going on. Because you can't really, you can't really understand this passage without understanding the background of it. Jesus had loved so much that he died on the cross out of great love. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he had arisen some days ago. And now, when this passage is written, Jesus has left Jerusalem, and he's up in Galilee, where his disciples had fled to get away from everything. And uh, so, they're out fishing. They're, they're, when this, you read this passage, they're out fishing, they're in the boats, and somebody says, it's the Lord. Look, it's the Lord. And they made their boat back and Peter swam back and Jesus cooked breakfast for them. And after breakfast was over, Jesus began having this conversation with Simon Peter. And I am so glad that we get to listen in on that conversation because, in fact, the Scripture actually says to us, as we read it a moment ago, that Peter got his tender little feelings hurt because Jesus asked him the question three times, do you love me? And the scripture actually does say in verse 17, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? But, but here's, first of all, it just starts off in an interesting way because Jesus asked this question, uh, Simon, do you love me more than these? So that's in, in verse 15. The very first question Jesus asked, Simon, do you love me more than these? Now, when I was 16 years old, I sensed God was calling me to preach, and our little church licensed me, and the summer came around, and they said to my twin brother, who is also a preacher, he's a pastoral psychologist, uh, they said, we have this mission just out of town and we can't find anybody to pastor it. Will you boys go out there and help? There are about 50 people. Would you go out and, and pastor that mission? So we did. We went out. And I would preach one Sunday morning and he would lead the singing. And that Sunday night, he would preach and I would lead the singing. It's sort of like Heckle and Jack. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde. And, you know, they never knew who and what. But... I remember coming across this passage for the very first time. Simon, do you love me more than these? And I was asking myself, I wonder, what, what did Jesus mean? Do you love me more than these? Surely he means, do you love me more than these other disciples? Because after all, when they were having their supper with him just days earlier, the last supper, Jesus had said that they were going, the disciples were going to run away, be afraid and run away. And Peter pops up and says, well, they may all do that, but I'm not that kind of guy. I'll stay with you to the end. 
So now Jesus is having this conversation with the guy who, who didn't stay with him till the end. In fact, denied that he even knew him. And, and so, even from a very young preacher, and that's I'm preaching in 1963, that's 50 years. But all of these years, I still find myself wondering, what did he mean? Do you love me more than these other disciples? Because surely, I thought, surely Jesus couldn't mean Simon, do you love me more than you love these nets, fish, boats, being on the sea? Do you love me more than you love this? <coughs> Surely Jesus couldn't mean that. But it didn't take me long as a pastor to discover lots of people love other things more than they love Jesus. That's just the way life is. Let's be honest about it. There are some people who, who because of what they want to do with their life. They feel like I can't do that and be a Christian. And they do love other things more than they love Jesus. Or maybe uh, it's, it's the pull of the crowd or, or whatever. But I got rid of that little nostalgic, tender way of thinking years ago of saying, surely you couldn't be asking, do you love me more than you love what you do in your nets and your boats? But regardless, here it is. Now, I'm going to give you right now, before I begin, well, I've already begun, I'm going to give you the three, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask three questions of you. I'll tell you what they are right now. You can scribble them down. Uh, the first one I'm going to ask you, as we look at this text, so what is the level of your love? What is the level of your love? And the second question I'm going to ask you in just a moment is, is your love, oh, how I love Jesus, your love for your spouse, your love for whatever, is your love a responsible love? Is your love a responsible love? And the last thing I'm going to ask you to reflect with me about is, are you thinking about the right person? Are you thinking about the right person? So let me get into it and tell you, what, tell you what I'm thinking about from, from this particular passage. Uh, first of all, I said, uh, the, what's the level of your love? Three times Jesus asked Peter this question. Now this is in verses 15 uh, where it starts. And and here's, here's what it is. And you can't see this in the English Bible. But you can see it very clearly in the Greek Bible. The Greek has many levels and shades of love. In English, as I say, I love my dog, I love hot dogs, I love a movie, I love a boyfriend, a husband, hopefully not my husband and my boyfriend. <laughs> anyway, you know, we just sort of cross it around. So Jesus asked the question this way. Simon, do you have an agape love for me more than these other guys? It, the, it is the word for agape. You've heard this often in the church. Agape love. Uh, a self-sacrificing type of love. So Jesus asked, Simon, do you have an agape love for me? But Peter answered, well, yes, Lord. Simon was never at a loss for words. And you can just almost hear, well, yes, Lord. You know that I have a friendship love for you. He used the word, not agape, but phileo, from which we get the city, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So get it in your mind here, get what, what's going on. Jesus asked the question, Simon, do you have an agape love for me? And Simon responds, sure, 
I have a friendship love. You're my best bud. We are BFF. Best friends forever. And Jesus then, the passage says in verse 16, asked him a second time. Simon, now Simon, but do you have an agape love for me? And Simon may be quick on the lips, but he's slow in the head because he doesn't get it yet. Jesus asked him the second time, do you have a, an agape, sacrificial love for me? And Simon just says again, of course, I have a friendship love for you like nobody else. So Jesus hears it. And then Jesus asked the third time, the scripture says in verse number 17, and this is where Simon gets his tender little feelings hurt. Now, I don't know whether he was hurt because Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Or whether he got his feelings hurt because of the way Jesus asked him this time. You see, both times previously, Jesus had said, Simon, do you have a sacrificial agape love for me? And he responded, yes, I'm your friend. I have a friendship love for you. Both times, that's the way it played out. This time, Jesus changed his word and came down to Simon's level. You can't see it in the English, but it's right there in the Greek. The third time, Jesus said, Simon, do you even have a friendship love for me? After all, what friend would do what Simon had just done a few days earlier and deny that he even knew who Jesus was. Do you get it? You understand? You, you understand what I'm talking about here? So Jesus changes his word. Simon, do you even have a friendship love for me? And Simon, whether he doesn't get it yet or whether he's just honest, most of us would probably have said, oops, Lord, I do have an agape love for you. But the problem is that Simon couldn't and didn't do that. Simon only said the third time, yes, Lord, I, I have a friendship love for you. Whoa, that's kind of heavy when you stop and think about it, isn't it? Jesus asking, what is going on with your love? Now, there's an interesting thing I need to tell you about this. First of all, Jesus didn't get upset and angry with him. See, you and I might have gotten upset after three times. You know, we might have put our hands on our hips and said, you know, I, I'm tired of this. I've asked you three times, and you are not answering the question the way I want it answered. But Simon was just, maybe Simon was just being honest. That all he could give to Jesus at that point in his life was a deep friendship kind of love, but Jesus was willing to accept that. Now this is this is this is really important. In your mind, put an asterisk, put a star here. This is really important. Because the good news of this is that Jesus can accept whatever kind of love you and I are capable of bringing to Him. And you know that there are some of you in this room who can remember years back, you started off and you loved Jesus, but now you look and you see that that love has intensified and it's turned into not just Jesus as, as my friend and Savior, which He is, but Jesus as the lover of my soul. Jesus as one I know who would do anything to show his love for me. It's so important that we understand that if we can't love Jesus like we would like or like we ought to love him, 
that that love can grow. He will accept you where you are. And that love can grow because, and I'm not going to ask you to, to read this, this passage, but later in your New Testament, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Simon wrote two little letters, letter first and second Peter, in the back of your New Testament. And in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, Peter is talking to people about how to let their love, or not their love, their life grow, embrace. And so he says, listen, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And then he added, and add to that goodness knowledge. And then he said, and add to knowledge self-control. And then he said, add to self-control perseverance. And then he said, add to perseverance, godliness. And then he said, add to godliness, brotherly love. And then he said, and add to brotherly love, a godly kind of love. You with me? I'm not with you. Well, <coughs> you want to change me or just the <laughs> Here you are. Okay, so we'll just, uh, we'll just act like... My BFF <laughs> is, is not here. Okay, here now, now you 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 get what I'm saying to you here. That now and Simon's life has changed, and as he comes toward the end of his life, and thank you so much, and as he's uh, and as he's writing this these two letters, he says, you know, as you grow in your faith, let that let that. Uh, brotherly love you have, let it grow. It can become agape. But don't beat yourself up if you can't start there. You with me? So that, that's, the, that's the first thing. And this sermon, you'll be happy to know, is more than half over already. <laughs> so don't worry. I'm not, uh, everything else is not going uh, this long. So here's, so, so here's the second thing. What what is the level of your love? And, and and if right now it's just a tired friendship, work on it. It can grow. Two. Is your love responsible? And here's 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 where I get. In each of these three cases, in, in verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. Every time Jesus asks Simon, do you love me? Simon responds. Jesus said, okay, I've got something I want you to do. Feed my lambs. The second time it was feed my sheep. The third time it was feed my sheep. But each time Jesus talked about Simon, is your love, if you, even if it's a friendship love, I trust you enough. I want you to do something for me. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Each time. Now, let me let me put this let me let me put this in position by telling you something. M many years ago, former pastor of First Baptist Church, San Antonio, Texas, was preaching at at uh, our state camp in Arkansas. And he said something that across these years, I've, I've never forgotten. Apparently, uh, there, had, there was a, a young man and woman who were engaged to be married. And they'd gone to the movie theater over the weekend. And while they were watching the movie, someone yelled out, fire, fire, there's a fire in the theater. And he was gone. She was still here in G17. <laughs> that would be a bingo game, though. Uh, she was sitting there, and he was gone. Well, everybody got out safely. But he saw his fiancée in the crowd across the way. So he made his way over to where she was and he put his arm around her and said, 
I'm so glad you got out okay. <laughs> yeah, you get it. She said something really loudly to him that he didn't want to hear. Without a single word, she said, If your love is not responsible, do you get it? Okay. Jesus trusts you and me. No matter what the level of love we have, He trusts us. Some of you, some of you can assume responsibilities as deacons or Sunday school teachers. Some of you can be trusted simply to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the community this week. Just to be the face of Jesus. But He trusts you. The question is, are we responsible? Are those of us who talk about how we love Jesus, are we truly responsible with our love? Now, uh, when, I was, when I was a child, at, uh, I, was, I was about six, maybe five or six, when both of my parents got tuberculosis. And my twin brother and sister and I, we had no place to go. So we went to an orphanage in Boonville, Arkansas. Lived there about seven years until our, our parents were recovered from their tuberculosis and our family could be back together. And I, I don't know how this happened in the years of living in that orphanage, but I, I, but I distinctly remember, I was about 10 years of age, and uh, the, the, the orphan bully took me on. Now, I have no idea how this happened, but I hit him in the nose, and his nose started bleeding, and he ran away, as bullies often do when you fight back. And I, as I say, I don't know how this happened, because I've sort of always operated on the premise that he who hits and runs away will live to hit another day. I don't know how this happened, but anyway, I hit him in the fight is over, and in the process, I was sort of the orphan hero for a few days. And I had the love of the most beautiful girl there. Twelve-year-old beauty. I remember our conversation. I used to say she was a perfect twelve. And my wife says, don't go there. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I won her heart, apparently. So I'm on the campus, and I see her across our campus, and she's swinging in the swing. I thought, this is just glorious. <laughs> I'm 10 years old for peace. <laughs> Actually, a 10-year-old probably, why was I thinking that way? But I, so I wanted to give her something. I wanted to show my love. Well, the construction workers had been on our orphan campus and they'd been doing some work and they left behind a bunch of nuts and bolts and slugs and things that they'd cut out and didn't want. They just left them behind and I discovered their cache where they tossed everything. So in my effort to give her a priceless gift, I grabbed a handful of those nuts and bolts and I didn't even stop to speak to her. I was so... It was amazing. It was amazing to show this depth of love. But I ran by her and I just <clears throat> dumped those nuts and bolts at her swinging little feet and <laughs> ran away without a word. Now listen, here's the thing. Through the years, through the years, that has stuck in my mind because there has been many a time that I have asked myself, wait just a minute. Are you doing the equivalent of just throwing at Jesus' feet the equivalent of nuts and bolts that you don't want and are not good for anything else? Are you just giving Jesus the leftovers of your life? Is love responsible? And for you and me today, we're at different places in our life, in our age, in our work, in our walk with Jesus. But 
What is it that you want to be responsible about in your love for Jesus? For some of you young parents, that responsibility may be just a matter of of training your children to know and love Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life. For those of you in different places, it might be different things. It may be someone, maybe someone in this group that has, has been challenged to assume a, a responsibility here or a task over there. But is your love responsible? I'll just leave that. So here's the third question now. The first one was, so so what's what's the level? Let's evaluate. Let's think about our love rather than just singing, oh how I love Jesus. Are we being responsible in our love? And the last question is this. Are we concerned about the right people in this love, walk, relationship we have with Jesus. And what do you mean by that? Well, in this passage, after three times, Jesus asks Simon, do you love me? And Simon answers that he's, he's really a good friend. Jesus, each time, said, okay, there's something I want you to do and be. And then, Simon's feeling pretty good about things right now. And so, in verse 20, it says that Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, uh, was following them. He was the one that leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Hey, uh, say, Lord, what do you want old John over here to be doing? And Jesus said to him, this is the Dickens translation. Jesus said to him, Simon, that's none of your business. If I want him to stay on earth and wait for me until I come back, that's none of your business. That's between him and me. What I want you to do is I want you to be responsible for following me. How many times is it that we in a loving community, which we call church, how many times is it that we sometimes get upset with someone else it's one of the deacons. Sometimes maybe it's Pastor Butch. We get upset and we get to grumbling to ourselves and just, maybe I'll just do this, maybe I'll just do that. If so and so, if, if he can't be any better than that, if she can't, if that's the way she's going to treat me, if that's the way whatever, and Jesus would come knocking and say, look, you take care of you. Let me take care of that person. I'm capable of doing it. Do you get it? You understand what I'm saying? So anyway, I, I you know, uh, right now I'm out of sermon. So this is this is generally that's a great time to stop. Except I want to I want to tell you about something that happened to me in the Philippines one day. I was pastoring at Clark Air Base, and I, I do I want to finish with this. Pastoring at Clark Air Base. And I get this telephone call from a, a lady in the States. And she, and she says to me, uh, Dr. Dickens, you don't know me. I've had a hard time finding you. Uh, gone through the Foreign Mission Board. And uh, I found a way to contact you. She said, here's the thing. She said, several years ago, my son in the Air Force, there at Anjali City, at Clark Air Base, fell in love with a young Filipina. They got married. They had a child later moved back to the States. Unfortunately, they divorced. And she took the young daughter, and she lives there in, I think it was uh, Bamba. And she said, we understand that the mother is dying of cancer. And my family would like to seek permission to help raise that child here in the States. Would you see if, if they would consent, the mother would consent to the child coming to the States and letting us raise this child? Well, I was a little bit uh, 
not courteous. Initially, I said, there is no way that I'm going to help you take a young child away from a dying mother. There's no way I will do that. I will not help you. I will talk to the family and, and the mother, and if they feel that, that they would like the child to have the opportunity to come to the States, in that case, I will be willing to help them and you. So I went to visit the family, and they, they said, yes, we would love for this to happen. We would love to give this child some opportunities here. And so, about three or four weeks later, on Wednesday night after prayer meeting, one of my deacons came up to me and said, Pastor, uh, you had asked if a grandmother in the States could write me. And he said, I got a letter in the mail earlier this week. And he said, actually, I just forgot about it for several days until now. And I read it, and the letter said, we understand that the mother has passed away. We have made arrangements on this flight, on this day, for her to fly to the United States. It was tomorrow. It was 8 o'clock after prayer meeting. The flight was the next day. And... Uh, he didn't know how important that letter was. I mean, it is. But I got one of my Filipino deacons and said, Chuck, I need you to come with me. We need to go to Bombon and make a visit. And so here at 9 o'clock at night, I'm out there at this family's home in Bombon and telling them, I am so sorry that I just now, just an hour or so ago got this letter. But here is, here is this. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And you can imagine how painful it was for this family to say, we'll do it. This is too quick. They didn't have time to really say goodbye, did they? Uh, no big party. I mean, it was painful. But they said, we will do it. So I was driving back home. Here again, now it's about 10 o'clock at night. And my Filipino friend sitting on the other side of the car said to me, Pastor, you're mighty quiet right now. And I said, Chuck, I'm just hurting. I'm just, I'm just hurting for this family that loves and wants to help this child whom they love. But this is so quick. And I'm just hurting for them. And I said, you know, Chuck, I can't help but think this family, as painful as this is, is doing something out of love. Because they want this child to have an opportunity that they felt they could not give her. And I'm thinking right now, Chuck, that when God sent his boy to this earth, he wasn't sending him to have the possibility of a better life. When God sent his boy to this earth, he knew that he was going to be mistreated and killed as a common criminal, not to have a better life. It only happened because God loved us that much. And I just happened to be thinking about that. So I finish here this morning by saying, love, well here in his love, the scripture says, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to die on the cross for our sins. I don't know where you are in your life in this love relationship with Jesus, but I hope you can keep growing.
to friendship love, you can add sacrificial love. Let me pray for you that that would be the case. Lord, it would be too easy right now to just tell you how much we love you. But it's true. Help us to love you better. Help us to love you as best we can day by day. Help us to thank you. And help us to be responsible for our love, just as we are. Thank you for letting us be in a church that experiences this kind of love and teaches it to us. My prayer is that there might be someone here today who would say, I need to be a part of that kind of love and that kind of fellowship. And however it's done, whether it's in a conversation with the pastor or a friend, help us to do just that and to grow in our love. In your name, love. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the beautiful message about love.